someone asked me if I would talk about relationships in Buddhism. And I recently gave a talk to students at Curtin University about uh, Buddhism and relationships in the modern world. So I'd like to uh, talk around this uh, topic tonight. It uh, also is a continuation of talks I gave a few months ago about the relationship between parents and children and children and parents in terms of the Dharma. When we think about relationships in Buddhism, or when we think about relationships in general, we are usually thinking about relationships with things outside ourselves, with other people, with the objects in our world, and with uh, concepts like my status. But the Buddha's teaching encourages us to understand that the primary relationship that we have in this life is the relationship that we have with ourselves. And in the practice, as we come to work with this, we see that there's a sort of paradox, a contradiction. We are working from the relationship with ourself into the world of relationships with other people and with objects. But we also get our sense of who we are and identity from our relationships with others. It doesn't come in a vacuum who we think we are, where we think we fit into the world. So it's not that our relationships with others are incidental, but the focus in Buddhist practice and the place where we have to pay attention is within our own mind and body. And the Buddha said when we understand that, then we will be able to interact with the world in a much more skillful way. One of the things about modern life and the modern world is, as I mentioned uh, in brief in a previous talk, relationships today are much more expendable, much more built on shifting sand. The sort of relationships which give us our sense of identity, our self-image, these days are much uh, less likely to be things that are with us permanently throughout the whole of our life. So, for example, with the fact that people are moving from one country to the other, from one culture to another, from one location within a country to another. The sense of identity that we used to have around, oh, I'm Australian, or I'm a Westerner, or I'm from here, or I'm from there, or that I'm uh, from a particular culture, or that I... Um, and even from a particular uh, background, those things are much more uh, change changeable now than they used to be. Even in terms of our career, in the past it was that, uh, what are you going to be when you grow up? Oh, I'm going to be an architect. Oh, what do you do for a job? Oh, I'm an architect. What do you do? I'm an architect. What kind of person are you? an architect. Our sense of who we are was built around and is built around the things that we are doing in this world as well as 
the relationships that we have. But these days, many of those anchorage points for our sense of who we are are changing constantly because, for example, people don't stay in the one career. They shift between this and that or they build on to what they started off with. They don't stay in one place. They might be born in one country, educated in another and working in another and then marrying someone from the other side of the world and living in an environment which is a mixture of cultures, a mixture of relationships. And so this whole sense of identity these days is much more scrambled than it used to be when we did the same job, lived in the same place, related to the same people, throughout the whole course of our life. And even the relationships that we have with our family. People are moving around so they may no longer be in touch with the people that they are, with their brothers and sisters that were the most important people with, for them for the first uh, 15 years of their life. They don't have contact with their parents regularly. So all of this uh, idea of who I am, which we've built up, through relationships with uh, the world of people and objects, ideas. This is uh, very much these days uh, a world of uh, shifting, changing relationships and images of who we are. And this can cause problems. People feel they don't know where they fit in. Very often young people who've uh, come to Australia with their parents are uh, coming particularly from uh, an Asian background because uh, one of the things that me it means that people can see that they're from a different uh, uh, background, a different uh, culture than uh, the Western culture in Australia. Uh, immediately they can be identified as uh, having come from somewhere else and so very often these young people feel they don't know where they fit in. They're trying to uh, uh, mix with their uh, Aussie friends and do what uh, their uh, friends at school or friends at uni are doing, and yet their uh, family expectations and how they're expected to behave in their, uh, uh, with their parents and with their extended family is quite different. So just things like, uh, should I leave home when I get a job? Or should I stay at home until I'm married? even if I've got a job, even if I'm 30. These kinds of things, it seems uh, uh, sometimes we can smile, but these are the sorts of uh, life questions that people have uh, to answer, especially coming into a different culture and having their sense of identity eroded by the fact that they're mixing in so many different kinds of social groups. This can be a problem or it can be just one of the things that we use in our practice because in fact what this points to is what the Buddha was saying 2,500 years ago that we cannot find who we are, the definition of ourself from the things of this world. Because the things of this world are always going to be changing, shifting, becoming other than they are. So even in the time of the Buddha when there wasn't this great uh, uh, movement of people and this great uh, cross-fertilization between cultures and uh, social settings as there is today, even at that time, the Buddha was encouraging people to see that there's no stability or security in the world. And when we try to fix who we are, that sense of who we are, by defining ourselves in terms of the things of the world, then we're always leaving ourselves open to suffering even if we identify with this body. I'm Asian. 
or I'm female, or I'm old, or I'm healthy. All of those things are only passing, superficial. None of those things is the essence of who we are. We can become ill overnight. If we're young now, we're going to get old. Any of those things can change. And so the Buddha encouraged us to look within for who we really are. And this might seem in contradiction to the teaching on non-self. Because what we have to do is to we, we have to go through layer upon layer of who we think we are until we come to the uh, point where we recognize, well, there's nothing there that is essential, that is substantial, that is unchanging. There is no core there that isn't just conditioned, arising and passing away. But we have to discover this for ourselves through the practice. And how this relates to relationships is that very often when we start to discover this shifting sand of self, this shifting sand of identity based on the changing things of the world, the uncertain things of the world, then we look for some kind of security or stability in a relationship with another person. We hope that that relationship is going to fill the void or fill the gap that we feel, that we experience in ourselves. So we move into relationships hoping for a sense of completion, a sense of wholeness that we haven't experienced in the world of phenomena, things outside ourselves, or even in our own uh, sense of who we are. And when we look for someone outside ourselves to complete the picture, to give us that security, to really define who we are, then we are expecting more from relationships than they are able to give. And this is a very important point. It's not that relationships can't give some things. It's not that relationships are useless or empty of uh, goodness, empty of value. No. But they can't give us that sense of completion. Trying to find that in another person from another person is just looking in the same empty space that we have within ourselves that we haven't been able to find within ourselves and looking for it in another person. And they're in the same boat we're in. But uh, through wrong understanding, we think that by coming together, we'll be able to fill that gap. And uh, so we get involved in intimate relationships but not just intimate relationships. Any of the close relationships, any of the kind of partnerships in life that we have, there's always this hope that this relationship is going to make me feel safe and secure and give me the love which I'm looking for. And in intimate relationships particularly, when uh, people come together, initially there's a, a 
great sense of uh, joy, a sense of uh, happiness, the thrill of having found one's mate, one's partner. And uh, according to studies that have been done, the actual process that happens when two people come together is that when you come in contact with someone that you identify with as being your mate, that produces a biochemical reaction within the body. That biochemical reaction affects the body and affects the mind and produces pleasant feelings. And that's that thrill that we get when we're in love, that energy, that feeling of uh, we could conquer the world, everything's okay, we feel energised, we feel positive. And there's actually something happening, a biochemical reaction happening because coming in contact with this person has triggered that reaction within our own mind and body. But the problem is that, so the uh, scientists have discovered, this kind of reaction is only triggered during the first three years or so of contact. Only lasts that long. And then after about three years of being in constant contact with that person, they no longer have that same effect. They no longer trigger that same biochemical reaction within us. And the thrill is gone. And this is uh, what happens very often in relationships. This is when the divorce takes place, after the thrill is gone. But very often, unfortunately, by that time there are children. And so uh, people have to learn to find something more in that partnership than just the thrill. And this is the hard work part of the relationship of working together to find things in that relationship, things in that other person, things in being together that, is, that are productive of happiness. This uh, is the hard work part of relationship. And what happens when we don't understand this, when we don't understand that this is uh, a conditioned phenomena and this is changing, we think something's gone wrong when that uh, thrill is no longer there. We expect that it will last forever. We expect the relationship to retain the same kind of intensity that it had in the beginning. And when it doesn't stay like that, it must be someone's fault. It can't be my fault, it must be your fault. This is what happens. It's wrong understanding, expecting what was there to stay like it forever, not understanding that it's a process and that it's a mutual relationship. You don't give me a thrill and I don't give you a thrill. Now when we don't understand that, we look to blame and we look for someone else, another partner, who will restore that kind of uh, good feeling. And we think when we find the next partner and go through the same process, ah, now I've found it. The first person was, was not the right partner. Now I've found the right partner because I feel just like I did in the early days before. And we expect that it, that's going to last forever. I'd love to ask you if there's anyone here who's been married more than five years who still feels the same intensity now that they felt in those early days. Ah, come on. Congratulations. But for most of us, we know that this is true. There has to be more to the relationship than uh, just that uh, kind of uh, attraction, even if it's uh, not just physical but you're attracted to someone's good qualities, there has to be something more in the relationship to make it uh, last and also to make it a 
a platform for growth for not only the people who are the partners but the children of that uh, relationship. And so if we understand that it's no one's fault, this is just natural, we had unrealistic expectations in the first place, and this is hard work, then we're much more willing to address what needs to be addressed in order to make the relationship work. And in terms of practice, the Buddha said, what needs to be addressed first of all is the purity of our own state of mind. Someone was telling me recently that one time they were talking to Achan Brahm and they said to Achan Brahm, you know, this person's not really a good Buddhist because they swear. And Achan Brahm said to this person who was complaining, in Buddhism, we like to spend 90% of our time looking at ourselves and only 10% of the time looking at other people. And that was all he said, but immediately the person got the message. And so this is uh, something for us to reflect on, particularly in relationships. We have to keep coming back to the state of our own heart and the state of our own mind. And the tools that the Buddha gave for us to use are the four foundations of mindfulness. This is straight Buddhist practice, but if we understand what these uh, focuses of mindfulness are pointing towards, then we can see that this is actually the way of using the teaching to help us to keep our focus within our own heart and mind predominantly. Because these four focuses of mindfulness, the four places where we should focus our attention, are all about our own mind and our own body. The first focus for our attention is the body itself. And paying attention to our movements to the activities that we're engaged in while we're engaged in them, doing one thing at a time and doing it with our full attention. This is a very uh, skillful way of refraining from always looking over our shoulder at what the other person is doing. When we look over our shoulder at what the other person is doing, very often they're not doing it the way we like them to do it way we want them to do it. They're not uh, doing things in a way which uh, pleases us, even if we're uh, not even engaged in the same activity, particularly when we're sharing a living space, particularly when we've got uh, a couple of people, especially children around. It's very easy to get irritated and to be drawn out, focusing all the time on what they're doing how they're doing it. And they're not doing it the way that I like it to be done, when I want them to do it. And so uh, this is one of our safeguards, if you like, to keep our attention focused on what we're doing and how we're doing it. Even just in the meditation, when we pay attention to the breath, the mind wanders away, we can notice that it's hard to stay focused where we want our attention to be. Even when we're just sitting still and we're not having to do anything, it's hard to keep our attention focused on our own body. And then we can also notice the irritation that arises in the mind when we notice that we've lost the focus on the breath. When we notice that the mind has wandered away and we're caught up in thinking or that we're listening to the sounds outside, very often we will be observe that there's irritation in the mind in noticing that. So it's not just noticing 
and accepting and bringing our attention back to the breath, it's irritation arising and then often getting the opportunity to grow. This is stupid, this practice. Why did that person have to make that noise? Now they've disturbed me. On and on and on it goes. And this is what happens in our daily life also. We lose the balance of the mind because we lose our focus of attention. And then we focus more and more on the other person, on the other people. We give the opportunity for the defilements to arise and to grow. So the meditation practice is a great help for being able to strengthen that ability of the mind to keep focused and to retain that focus where we want it to be. And the more we can do that in the meditation, the more we'll be able to do it in daily life. And then once we're able to sustain our attention on the body, on what we're doing in our daily life, we will find that it allows the mind to abide in a much more peaceful, restful state. So when we do have to interact with the people around us, we will have uh, much more ease in that interaction. Now the next of the uh, focuses of uh, mindfulness is the focus on feeling. And feeling isn't emotion in this sense. Feeling is the immediate non-verbal reaction we have when we come in contact with something. In contact with something through the sense doors, through the eye door, what we see, through the ear door, what we hear, through the nose door, what we smell, through the taste, the tongue door, what we taste, and through the body door, what we uh, touch, we feel through touch. As soon as there's a contact made through any of those sense doors, there is a reaction produced within us. That, is not, that reaction is not something we have control over because it is conditioned by how we've reacted to that same thing or a similar thing in the past. So particularly in relationships, when the going's good, and we've been enjoying the, the uh, contact with a particular person, if we hear their voice, pleasant feeling arises. Before we've even uh, understood what it is that they've said, what their words what have conveyed, just the sound of their voice gives rise to a pleasant feeling. If we've uh, had an argument or if we're on bad terms with someone, the sound of their voice, before we've even heard what they've said, gives rise to an unpleasant feeling. What happens in the untrained person is that we blame the other for that unpleasant feeling within us. We think that the pleasant feeling has come from the other person but we are producing it within ourselves. So, for example, the person that we've had an argument with might be saying, darling, let's make up. I'll take you out to dinner. But the sound of the voice gives rise to unpleasant feeling. And if we don't notice that we are reacting to our own conditioning, not to what's been said to us, then we might blame the other person and react in an inappropriate way. That unpleasant feeling very often makes it impossible for us to hear what the person has actually said. The invitation to dinner isn't even heard. We just know that we're not interested what you say. And this is uh, what happens, particularly in uh, relationships where we're 
dealing with the same people over and over again. We are carrying on things from the past and living them out in the present without awareness, without recognizing that this is something old that is tainting what is happening right now. And so again in the meditation, we start to notice that underlying feeling tone, pleasant or unpleasant. And we notice that it's not connected to another person. Because in the meditation we have the opportunity to observe our reaction. Very often reactions triggered just by memories. The other person's not even here now. We're not even having to deal with them at this moment. It's our old conditioning, what we're carrying around with us, gives rise to this feeling, Vedana in Pali, and it's beyond our control. But what becomes within our control is how we are going to react to that feeling. First of all, we have to be able to notice it, to catch it. And then we have the opportunity to ask ourselves, is this appropriate at this time? Is this really to do with this moment or is it to do with the last moment? What is the skillful response? This only comes through practice. Because what normally happens, particularly with an untrained mind, is that the feeling is produced by the contact and we speak or act before we've had a chance to be mindful, to notice where it's coming from and whether what we're about to say or do is appropriate. So we need to practice in meditation to be able to pay attention to this pleasant, unpleasant production within us. And then to see that our response is actually a separate thing. That we only become able to notice that through practice, through strengthening the mind in mindfulness and also strengthening the mind in restraint, not just blurting out the first thing that comes, and then strengthening the mind in wisdom to be able to decide what is appropriate at this time in this place. The next uh, foundation of mindfulness is the mind itself. And this is the mind without an object. Just the, it's very hard to express this, and these words that I'm going to use are just approximations, but the flavor of the mind, the quality of the mind, the mood of the mind, not paying attention to a particular object, but just the state of the mind itself. And this is uh, observable, for example, sometimes uh, we wake up and for whatever reason, we just know we're in a good mood. We feel bright, we feel energized. The mind feels like it's uh, it's open. And whatever we're doing from the time we get up, it's okay. The mind uh, any, can deal with anything. There's no, no big deal about anything. Whether we're uh, brushing our teeth or eating our breakfast, whether we're uh, listening to the radio, all the different objects of attention are changing but the background 
quality of the mind is the same. Obviously, once we uh, know more about the way the mind is, it's not that the mind is constantly like that, but there's a continuity of a buoyant state of mind. And so we start to notice what is the, the background quality of the mind that we have at the moment. We use terms like good moods and bad moods. But we can be more specific once we start to uh, pay attention to our fluctuating uh, mental states. We start to be able to uh, notice that uh, there are differences between different kinds of bad moods. Some bad moods might be based on uh, disappointment. Some bad moods might be based on uh, anger. Some bad moods might be based on sadness. And they're all minds which are, if you like, uh, sinking or lacking in energy, have a gloomy sort of uh, uh, feeling about them. But they all have distinctive qualities. Good moods. Good moods might be based on uh, getting something that we uh, wanted to have or the fact that it's uh, a holiday without even knowing what we're going to do, just the fact that it's a holiday. It might be that we uh, woke up and the toothache we had isn't there this morning and so we're in a good mood. So there are many different reasons and there are many different qualities to what we call a good mood. Now why it's important to be able to pay attention to the flavour of our mind, the moods of our mind, the qualities of our mind, is that they will influence how we interpret, how we relate to the interactions we have with the people that we're sharing our life with. If we're in a good mood, then someone can do something that normally would upset us and it's okay. And if we're in a bad mood, someone prepares us our favourite food and, oh, not that again. So again, we're seeing it's not the person, it's not the thing out there, it's what's going on within our own mind which is colouring our experience and colouring our interaction, the quality of the relationship that we're having. So we need to become skilled at being able to identify what kind of background noise is going on that we're operating with this particular time, this particular person. That's the uh, third foundation of mindfulness. The last foundation of mindfulness is to be aware of the objects that the mind pays attention to. Particularly when we're thinking about relationships, to be aware of when the defilements are present in the mind. The defilements are impurities which arise, triggered by conditions, in the world, conditions in our environment, conditions within ourself. And when those defilements or impurities are present in the mind, the Buddha said they make it impossible for us to see clearly. And in relationships, it makes it impossible for us to see our own behaviour clearly, to see the uh, behaviour of the other person clearly, and also to see the circumstances of the situation that we're in, clearly. These defilements of the mind are, uh, just to go through them quickly, uh, sensual desire, that greedy, wanting mind, wanting to have things comfortable, pleasant, the way I, th I think it should be. Uh, ill will, which is the uh, irritated, angry, uh, hateful mind. The uh, next uh, of the defilements is restlessness and worry. So we know in our daily life that if we're preoccupied with something that uh, 
isn't even to do with right now but is something that's happened in the past or something that we're worrying about in the future, if that's preoccupying us, taking over the mind, then very often we're in a bad mood and we're not interested in what's going on with the person that we're uh, closest to. Our mind is uh, full of our own stuff. And uh, the next of the defilements is called uh, sloth and torpor. And this is a sort of laziness, heaviness in the mind where we can't be bothered. It's too much trouble. We're not interested. And how often do we uh, find ourselves in our relationships just not wanting to hear their stuff again, not wanting to have to deal with their things? Just leave me alone. Just give me some space. This is uh, an expression of this uh, impurity in the mind, the lack of energy to give to what uh, is uh, right in front of us, the person who's right in front of us now, who needs us now. And then the last of these uh, defilements is called uh, sceptical doubt. And this is uh, usually classically uh, described as doubt in the teacher or the teaching in terms of the Dharma, but it's also doubt in ourselves that we can actually do the practice, that we can actually purify our mind, that we can actually get out of any of the difficult situations that we find ourselves in. And so this is uh, what happens very often when people come to the end of the uh, road in their relationship. They don't think that there's any... Uh, any hope, any place we can go, anything we can do, people give up. And so if we are starting to pay more attention to our own state of mind and to what's going on in our mind, we start to hear significant phrases very often that point to the presence of these impurities can't be bothered. It's pointless. It's hopeless. I've got to have this. These are all uh, phrases that can be used if we're uh, awake to uh, wake us up to the fact that the defilements are present. And if the defilements are present, then we'd better be cautious. we better be careful about what we say and do, particularly in relationship to the person who's closest to us, the person that we're living with, or the people in our family, whether they're our uh, partners, our children, or our parents, our brothers or our sisters, whether they're our work colleagues, whether they're the people we spend a lot of time with. Now, all of this brings us back, these four foundations of mindfulness, to the territory of our own in a world. It's only when we familiarize ourselves with our inner world and start to purify the impurities, remove the impurities, that we're able to engage in our relationships more skillfully, more profitably. And what happens as a an effect of purifying our own mind is that we start to uncover within ourselves the things that we were hoping to find or to get from the people that we're relating to. As we purify the mind of greed, hatred and wrong understanding, ignorance, automatically, naturally, we experience a greater sense of inner peace, inner ease, benevolence towards ourselves, acceptance of ourselves, love towards ourselves. As we start to purify our uh, mind, we automatically purify our speech and our behavior. So we start to have much more confidence in ourselves, confidence in how we're going to react, 
confidence in uh, what we're going to do in particular situations. Because now we know that we are much less likely to speak or act out of selfishness or heedlessness, lack of mindfulness. We may not uh, know exactly the right thing to do, but as we practice and develop mindfulness and the strength of the mind to refrain or restrain impulsive speech and behaviour, we know that we're unlikely to just be pushed along by our unwholesome conditioning. So greater inner confidence arises. And as we less and less put our foot in it, make things worse by what we say and do, then that again builds up this sense of, I'm not such a bad person after all. It builds up our sense of uh, self-esteem. It builds up our sense of love for ourselves. And then as we also practice to uh, keep paying attention to the reality of this mind and body, we start to see more clearly the truth about life, the nature of reality. We don't expect things to be the way that suits us. We start to understand the process, the underlying laws of nature that we're subject to, the law of impermanence, things coming together, staying that way for a while, changing and passing away. We see that with our mind states. We see that with our reactions. We notice it in our body. We start to tune in to the truth of impermanence and how we cause ourselves suffering by hanging on to things that are constantly in flux, trying to make them stop, be fixed, be firm, be stable, when they're not like that. Our own mind, our own body, everyone's the same. So as we purify the mind, we can see these truths more clearly. We can accept them with less pain. And then the security that we were looking for in the relationships that we have, hoping that this person is going to make us safe, we start to understand what a foolishness. Of course, this person, other person, can't create safety and security for me. No one can. The very nature of this life is change. And the way that I can find security is by learning to accept that and learning to live my life within that framework. Instead of hoping that someone else is going to give us that safe place, we start to find that safe place within our own mind, within our own heart, within our own understanding. So we become more and more independent of relationships with others, but not cut off. Independent in the sense of expecting from them what they cannot give we become more realistic. And in becoming more realistic, we engage in our relationships much more honestly, much more uh, openly, and much more realistically. And as we purify the mind even further, that sustains us from within. The wisdom the understanding and the love that grows within our own heart for ourselves is where we find our true refuge in this world. We no longer are dependent to the in the same way, to the same extent, on the relationships around us. 
so we can engage in those relationships in a much more open-handed way. Accepting other people as they are without expecting that they will serve us. We free ourselves of needing to be served by other people. And in Buddhism, this is uh, the result of practice. This is where we're heading for in our practice. Not to become cold-hearted and withdrawn from the world, but to be able to engage in the world without expecting more from the world, more from the people in it, more from our relationships than they can uh, give us. So this is uh, the teaching I'd like to offer tonight and uh, wish for all of you that it will be of benefit and that it will help us all to attain Nibbāna. If anyone has any questions or comments, I'd um, be happy to try to answer them. Yes, one at the back. Thank you for reminding me. Um, the question was, are emotions the same as feelings? Now, in these four focuses of mindfulness, emotions are not feelings. Or it's terminology. In English, we use the word feeling to mean emotion. But in this uh, uh, categorization, they are distinct. The feeling is a conditioned reaction which is a mental has a mental component but is also experienced in the body. The pleasant and the unpleasant feeling is experienced both mentally and physically. The emotion is the next is another aspect of the mind. It is our reaction to that feeling that is produced. The emotion in Buddhism and in terms of the four foundations of mindfulness is called sankhara. Sankhara is the uh, produced mental reaction that is reacting to our internal reaction. Through wrong understanding, we blame the object that has produced the reaction. But as we start to be able to uh, break down the process of what's happening, we understand that contact with an object produces a reaction within us, that's the Vedana, and then we react to that reaction. And the way that we react to that reaction is with emotion. And that emotion is not to do with that object, but to do with how we've reacted to that object. Does that make sense? So the same object, say, say someone uh, um, plays a particular piece of music, for example. That particular piece, piece of music, everyone will have an individual reaction to it. Even though it's the same object, each person's reaction to it will be different. If it's um, a piece of music that one likes, say it's, uh, it's rap music, and if you really like rap music, then when you hear it, there'll be a pleasant feeling and then you might try to, uh, oh, that's so-and-so playing. If you don't like rap music, the first note that comes out will be, produce an unpleasant reaction and you'll start to, to dislike, oh, who's that? What's that noise that's coming? It's the same object, but everyone has a different reaction depending on their past conditioning, their past experience with that thing. And then in the present we react afresh, and that is the new conditioning that we put down. So next time, that pattern will be repeated again. So what we're trying to do through practicing is to break those patterns. Some of the patterns we have 
a good pattern. So we want to make those grow. We want to strengthen them. But some of the patterns we have are uh, no longer useful, no longer appropriate. So, for example, when people see a cockroach, now it depends um, where you are in your mind, how you relate to that cockroach. Cockroaches seem to be the bottom line for most people. If they're trying to keep the five precepts, they can tolerate almost anything but cockroaches. So if, you're, if you see a cockroach and you're full of loving kindness and you love cockroaches, then cockroach will just be another living being sharing your space. So I, there are people who feel that way about cockroaches, truly. Now, if you are trying to practice loving kindness and compassion and uh, you are also really determined to keep the five precepts, when you see that cockroach, you might... <coughs> and then, oh, I, I would really like to do something with this cockroach. But because you're trying to practice loving kindness and compassion, you don't have any loving kindness and compassion for it, but at least it refrains you from just squishing it. You, you have your commitment to the precepts and so you refrain from just doing what you feel like doing. You can notice that the pull towards hitting it or getting rid of it or getting angry with it. You know, it's not just enough to squish it, you've got to get angry with it too because it came into your space. And all of these things are a process, building on, building on, building on, conditioned by what we've experienced. Now, in that situation, part of the conditioning is our attitude to cockroaches before we became a Buddhist, and part of it is the attitude to cockroaches since we're trying to practice the five precepts. There's two lots of conditioning in there, at least. We might have the conditioning that we don't like cockroaches because they're creepy, we might have the conditioning we don't like them because they carry disease. So that's another kind of conditioning. All these things are going through the mind like this. But through our mindfulness, we start to notice that. And even if we can't bring up loving kindness, at least we can refrain from killing this um, insect. And then if we take the trouble to try and take it out without killing it, however much effort we put into doing that, brings up a sense of joy in us. Even if it was hard, even if we didn't like it, at least we were true to what we aspire to live in our life, harmlessness. And so that brings up a feeling of joy. So next time when we see a cockroach, there'll still be... But there'll also be a little bit of that joy in there. And so that's how we little by little start to change our reactions. Old reactions come up, we notice them, we refrain from acting on them impulsively. We change the best we can. And then next time we've modified that reaction. And this is cause and effect, cause and effect. And this is very important for understanding that there's no absolute core self here. Because all of those reactions are conditioned. And when we change our conditioning, we change our reactions. There's not anyone in there saying, oh, we'll change this one, but we won't change that one. There's no one in there pulling the strings. It's cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect. So just the experience, like with cockroaches, for example, is a very powerful teaching in non-self, anatta, the emptiness. So the more that we are willing to put the, these uh, instructions into practice, particularly in our relationships where we have a lot of emotional investment, these are where we, we learn the really hard lessons, the really powerful lessons, because we see that we can change something which we thought was just me. I could never learn to tolerate that. I never put up with that. But we can. And then that, that's when we say, well, it's worth trying to do it because it helps me to live in harmony with this person who I really value. So this is how the practice, which seems sometimes very theoretical and removed from our daily life, this is how the practice is actually the support for uh, helping us to live more peacefully with ourselves and more in harmony with each other. It 
it's a cultural thing, but it's a traditional thing. Particularly in the um, time of the Buddha, um, people didn't wear shoes. They walked everywhere with bare feet, unless they were very wealthy, and then they had sandals, and then they had uh, means of transport. So it's, um, it's the dirty part of the body. It's the part that comes in contact with the, uh, the feces and the spit and uh, all the bits and pieces that are on the roadway. And so uh, it's a convention that one would not um, want to put something which uh, is uh, in contact with uh, dirt uh, in the direction of something which you uh, give great value to. So it's a convention, but it's an expression of an inner state. So we want to pay respect. And this is one of the ways we do it. And the thing to um, notice with all of these conventions is my reaction to it. What comes up in the mind when someone asks me to do something in a particular way? Recently we've been um, trying to encourage people not to wear shorts when they come to the centre, particularly when they come to the centre uh, to hear the teaching. Because um, although shorts are very acceptable in um, uh, Western society and in Perth particularly with the climate, the shorts again are sort of a, a signal of the, this is casual. This is uh, something that I can uh, you know, not take much trouble over. And we're trying to encourage the sense from the time we're getting ready to come to, uh, to hear the Dharma that we're, we're going to do something which is really important this is a teaching which can take us out of suffering. This is a teaching about the ultimate truth of existence. So as a way of expressing how highly we value what we're coming to do, we dress accordingly. And there may be uh, different codes of uh, dress and acceptance. People might say, oh, well, these days it doesn't matter what you wear, but it matters to some of the people who come here because in terms of... Uh, their approach, uh, they come here ho holding the Dharma and the teaching in the highest esteem. And so uh, out of respect for those people, wanting to uh, not uh, cause them to be uh, disturbed, then we can uh, put away our shorts when we come to the centre and uh, dress in a way which is uh, appropriate for uh, a sacred space. So we can notice what the mind says about that. Does my comfort take uh, uh, precedence over uh, doing something which I know offends others? Can I give up my, what I think is uh, necessary for my comfort? Is it really? Am I willing to do that? So in, in uh, terms of the practice, we would encourage people to do not to wear shorts, but we would never turn anyone away because they are wearing shorts. But again, it's the wrong understanding if we think, oh, well, Buddhism is about no rules. That's not accurate either because the Buddha's given us these very clear uh, guidelines, these very clear instructions, do this for this result. If you want to get from here to there, this is how you do it. If there were no rules or no guidelines, the Buddha would have just said, well, find that out for yourself. But he didn't. He said, do it this way and you'll get the result. If you don't want to do it this way, fine. But if you want to uh, achieve the results which are possible, this is the way to go.